What's up, everyone? This is David, a.k.a. Reverse Long, and today I got Karan Khanna on the podcast. He is a systematic trend-based trader, uses some discretion, and uh, we're going to get into deep into how he trades. Uh, I've been uh, excited to get him on the podcast because I've, I've seen some of his stuff. Like, for example, he did an interview with, like, Trade Zero uh, with Steven Johnson, and also... He did another one with Spike Eat, Noam Cohen. Uh, I've I've done podcasts with both. Both are really cool people, that, really nice people that I've, I've interacted with many times. And now I get to uh, go a little deeper here and, and and talk to Karan as well. So with all that being said, he, today we're going to interview trader Karan Khanna. How are you doing? Good, buddy. How are you? Good, good, man. Good. Yeah, so we were talking off the podcast, this market's... A little different now. Uh, well, yeah. a lot different. More tr- uh, like it's it's not it's it's range bound. It's not really trending. It's a little it's uh, it's harder to trade. I agree. I agree. It's it's harder to trade, man. Uh, the market's changed. Like I started trading 2020 full time. Since the, since 2020 up to up to this year, it was trending. You can figure out what direction you want to take, and you can you can go heavy size. Even I, a lot of traders went heavy size. They had astronomical gains um and now now it's like you got it's like it's it's uh yeah yeah so so before we get into all that let's get a let's get a background on yourself so like where are you from sure. and yeah the stuff before we go deep into trading i know we will so yeah definitely well i'm from uh canada toronto canada and uh, i now live in new york city i work uh in new york city so uh, you know when i i basically had a startup in canada and uh, when I, you know, it didn't work out, you know, it was, uh, uh, it was a small country and uh, the, we were doing a competition to Instacart. I launched it in 2012. I was doing that, but then it didn't work out. So I wanted to figure out a second source of making income. And I got into stock market, uh, came across Tim Sykes, actually. And uh, I just was like, you know what? I have nothing to lose. Let me just join the challenge. Worst case, I'm just going to learn and I'll be involved in the community. And the fact that I'll pay money, it's going to force me to learn. Uh, so I just did that. I think 2018, I started studying. But the journey to just learn just the basics was a big one because I was I have purely tech background, right? And I did not know. When I started, I didn't even know what a broker was. I did not even know the difference between. I, I literally thought stocks and equities are two different entities. So it was uh, very much a big learning curve for me. Um, and I basically started following Ducks uh, in my early days. And I found that he's very much a data-driven tra- trader. And coming from an engineering background, it made the most sense for me. So then I started tracking. And uh, I felt I had an enough system ready to kind of start trading in 2020. And... Um, I started in 2020 with a $2,500 account and uh, grew it. I had an initial success until March, had grown it to 5K and then started market conditions changed, um, liquidity dried down. I remember distinctly from March to May, it was a very tough period. And I again started struggling and I lost majority of my money in locates because I would look, I remember I was using Trade Zero International at that point and locates had gone up crazy and I was not experienced enough to know when to locate and not. So I was getting FOMO and I would keep locating and not take the trade and keep losing money. And eventually I mid-year, I had enough data to kind of recalibrate my statistics. And I did that. And come June, I start, or come end of May, I you know took that 800. And I think it was UAVS or UVXY. I don't remember what UAVS, I believe that the stock was. It went from one to five in two days. I'm like, you know what? Forget it. I'm just going to go full in. I went, I had 800 bucks. I'm like, what do I have to lose? I went full 6x leverage, shorted it close to fives. And to my luck, it halted and opened at one. And that just kind of gave me a jump start to my account again. And uh, I remember at that time, Tim Britani was also very active in Tim Sex Challenge. So I was also following him very closely. And, you know, he, I would like to say that Tim's, Tim Britani set my foundation. So um, got to interact and understand how he was doing it. And from there, I was able to f- fine tune a style that fits for my personality, but really adopting the things that I learned from Britani and Ducks. And, um, but now I have changed it to how it fits my personality. And yeah, from there, it was smooth, smooth graph for me. Uh, mostly I figured out how to position size. That was the key, key moment when I 
understood how to take my game to the next level, which is adding to winners. Once I figured out how to add to winners, I was able to minimize my downside and maximize my upside up, upside very quickly. Awesome, man. Okay, so a lot of stuff there. So, okay, um, you started in the Tim Sykes Challenge. Uh, what what year was that? You said 2020 is when you started trading like more active. But what, yeah. what, what year did you start? 2018, I, I joined Tim 18, Sykes. so a little bit after me. And I think Ducks was like 2017. Yeah. Okay, so Ducks made a, so Ducks was like, he was over like a million at this point. Yeah. But not like, not like uh, what he is now. He's He was on the way. Our oh, Ducks is over 40, 50 million easily. I, I yeah, yeah. Guess, yeah. He doesn't <laughs> talk about it, but yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I've, I've heard the stories myself. Um, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so you didn't even know what, what a stock and equity was, this and that. That's crazy. And you were you were doing engineering in school at the time. Yeah, yeah. So I work as a software developer uh, for profession, and uh, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. So I come from an architecture background. I was in school when I started. Uh, grad school and I didn't even know you know how like the phones come with the apps this is like stocks mm -hmm. like Apple uh, I don't know if you have Apple phone but it has like the stock section yeah and like I was like trying to figure out how to delete it because I was like, it's, like I, I, didn't, I didn't understand it like the letters and the the, the charts <laughs> it's crazy how how like how brand new so the, the thing I mentioned that because like with the Sykes thing even though Sykes is is a is, is like he's, he's kind of like a character on the internet i think he it's it's good that you know if you have no idea how to trade a stock or what a stock is or anything i think sykes is is you know for for me it it, it was good because like i needed to start from absolute zero you know yeah. what i mean and then like and then like you know what i mean because you feel kind of dumb sometimes and in, in other like if you were to talk about stocks and like why you feel kind of weird why don't you know like i know with my friends outside of uh, you know in, in real life at the time i was afraid to ask those questions like hey what is what are these letters what do these letters yep. need yep. what what what's this it's chart? a huge curve yeah, yeah it, it, you know and then when you have someone that can tell you what it is without having to like ask those really dumb questions and i feel dumb about it that's mm -hmm. how you get started and i think i think that was that foundation was, was it, it helped me you know because you need you need that you need to yeah. jump in there somehow you know, so screen time is also very important. Screen time is a must. Screen time, yeah. And then like you start to like, so for you, how did you get that screen time in? Like with you, um, so you, I, that, you were in school and working. So like, how did you? Yeah. So I uh, was waking up early and I would just sit in during market open. I showed up for two years did not miss a single day, just sat down and just watched the market open, watched the tape move, you know, just got that screen time on tape. You know, I can read the tape pretty well on a lot of market caps that I particularly trade. Um, and then in the evenings, I would start breaking down the charts and start gathering as to make notes as to what it did, why it did, uh, figure out what strategy would fit my personality, right? Um, and really, I found out that I'm not, I would like to say I'm not the best trader, but I'm really, this. my edge is my discipline. Right. Yeah. Oh, I can I can yeah. I can wait. I can wait for days without taking a trade. And I really doesn't affect me. Um, sometimes I do lose my uh, if I put a goal for myself. That's when the problem of discipline comes in. When I'm like, I want to make this much money this month or this year. And that's when I start forcing trades. But if I don't give myself that goal, I can really go without taking trades for days and not worry about it because um learning from Gratani and learning from Ducks, you know, going back their style, I, I, because I look, followed them, my style also came from, you know, somewhat how they trade and uh, their style is very much wait for those key setups and just hammer in size. And that's how I was able to also grow my account. You know, when my setups were coming on very often, I was able to take on big size and wait for the momentum shift, even though on the way up, I could lose, um, uh, some money, but because there was so much range, I was able to lose on starter positions and then re-attack and then double down my position when I'm in the money. So uh, that was something like CYDY was a classic example, right? I'd grown my account until June uh, from 800 to about, uh, I think 11 or 12 came and CYDY came and I was able to really hammer into a winner and I made $17,000 from an $11,000 account in a single day. Uh, that was that was long or short? Short. Short. Yeah, sure, sure. Long, so, short it, long the dip, short the bounce again. 
so you you uh okay so a few things there also okay so so discipline discipline is something is so important it's like with trading there's not many things that you can fully control discipline yep. you know it discipline you can fully control you know yep. it's it's up to you you know it's, yep. you know what i mean so there's certain degrees that you you know of it but like you can you can control it. it's fully controllable mm -hmm. um that's cool that you mentioned that. So like you can sit back and wait. So you study ducks. I know ducks, for example, he likes to wait, trade a couple of trades a month. Yep, you know, yep. He waits, he waits for his exact, I don't know, for example, if you want to name some criteria off the top of my head, I remember him saying something like he'll only short something over $6 and this amount of volume and yep. this amount of yep. gap up. And it, you know, so he waits for that, you know? So, and that's how he's able to use, but see, like he has a, a, a lot of capital too so he needs to be very specific he can't just jump into anything. i mean yeah but if you think about it you know uh let's take an example right and this i'm guilty of it this year okay uh because the market shift i'm still figuring it out but now i think i have enough data to start making judgments but think about it had i just traded the all side all in march just one trade in oil sector in march i would have been probably up over six figures this whole year and i wouldn't have to take a thing and i wouldn't I would be profitable and up six figures of the year taking one trade all year or just AMC and the oil sector just traded that I would have been prof I would have been up good but the fact that I forced certain trades because I was trying to ad adapt to the market the biggest problem was that I started being more on Twitter I started getting sucked into the fact that people are making money and things like that mm -hmm. um, but the biggest problem that I see now is that in this market, when locates are this expensive and when you are taking trades every day and there is not enough range to extract, are you really making money? I don't think so because uh, locates are eating up a good chunk because locates have yeah. gone up and I have four brokers that I have access to and they're all top tier brokers, right? I can get locates from multiple sources and I still, like just to give you an example, I paid $20,000 in locates this year and I haven't taken that many trades, but the fact that I was locating and not taking trades or locating and uh, it's the same story back in 2020 all over again, that's happening to me. So now I'm like, okay, there's one thing I can control is just wait for the setups that I recognize the best, wait for the ones that I know I can size up on. And if I do not feel comfortable, at least I made that a rule for me in July, I'm not going to even bother locating it. I'm, I'm, I rather miss the trade. I see. So so okay so before we get into more so when did you decide to become like a, a systematic trader you saw ducks and gratani i know gratani you know he he does he has a systematic approach he uses all these excel sheets and data and ducks takes it to another level but i think they have a, a big element too of discretionary um yeah. in them as well and that's why they're able to be like these outliers these crazy outliers so when did you decide um to 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 go the systematic approach? I mean, I always had a systematic approach from the get-go, uh, you know, just have understanding that market has, you know, when market has history, right? And history can be repeated. And if that stats that comes into it, right? Those That's something I knew from the get-go. So for me, it was how can I exploit it, right? Because uh, I knew that I'll go straight because I heard a lot of people on Twitter talking about algo driven trading, right? Uh, so when I knew that, I was like, okay, if algo footprints are programmed by humans, that means there are human footprints in there that you can figure out by tracking. Uh, really now that it came down to what setups I would like to track, what setups fit my personality, how would I like to trade? And me, I'm a risk averse trader. That means I do not want to put myself, although I'm in a very risky business, I like to be very cautious and, and to what setups I'm putting myself against. So I, I would rather wait and wait for the low hanging fruit and just hammer size on it. Unfortunately, not many low hanging fruits have been coming this year and I cannot take on size. But just to give you an example, last year, about 67% of my trades accounted for 80% of my profits, right? Um, and that's just because I know when the momentum shift has happened, I can come in, add to winners and scale in a heavy size and just, you know, extract the 30, 40% or even 10, 15% range. But if I'm on a hundred, $150,000 position, even if I'm taking 10 to 15%, that's still over 10, $15,000, right? And because I'm adding to winners, I can control my downside because I'm moving my risk down as and when the pops are failing, I start to move my risk down. 
Wow, interesting. Okay, so you would take a you would go heavy size. You said a hundred fifty thousand dollar position. I've been leveraged many times in my career. I've been leveraged massively, but my risk dollar risk was still proportional to my account size. Yeah. Wow. So I could see. Okay. So, and okay. So before we get into that more, going back to the locates. So who? So that's one thing they don't really teach how to like manage the locates together with the whole system and the, the short fees of like, um, I know I, I spoke to Jack Schwarzy, for example, he says he uses 2% rule for his locate, yeah. as long as the locate cost is more than 2%. And every, when he mentioned that, that was pretty clear. Yeah, so I, I go by, I pretty much am similar. Um, how do you, how's your rule with the locates? Anything is like yeah. too expensive? Not more than 5%. And I would go 5% when it is a thousand plus percent extension. I see. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I want to be a part of that trade, right? Because I, I know yeah, that yeah. the odds are stacking in my favor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned now the locates are more expensive. I noticed that too. So do you think it's because now the trend or, you know, we're range bound, but like the, the overall market's more, is more bearish now. It's like in a yeah. recession, recession mode almost, or or is, and uh, everyone. This is my theory. I don't know what do you what do you think. So like, everyone that made money long just by shooting darts and throwing, you know, buying everything long, they think it's easy to. It's like, oh, just switch to short now. I can yeah. just short, and now everyone the the short market is is a uh, there's a lot more demand, and yeah. the broker the brokers know it, and they raised all the prices. Um, uh, I don't know if everyone's shorting, uh, but my problem right now in this market, I don't know if you have noticed it, but I'm still trying to understand because on the front side of the move, there's high volume, right? But as soon as the backside hits, liquidity completely dries out. And I'm still not able to figure out why is that liquidity drying out? And my guess is that on the way up, not many buyers are in the game. Not many natural buyers are in the game. I mean, yeah. who is creating that volume? Because when the backside is hitting, I would expect buyers rushing, trying to rush out, especially in a bear market. I would expect buyers being more disciplined and trying to exit their positions and rushing out of the trade when it's not working in their favor, right? But really what I'm seeing is stocks slowly on low volume grinding back down and just holding a base. And then after days, just slowly going back down, right? It's not an organic... Yeah, Flush. a very good observation. Um, yeah, so I've noticed that too, and it, I didn't, you know, I just kind of brushed it off until right now. You mentioned it. So, do you think it's it's algos that trade with each other on the way up? Yep. And then and then it's like the algos at one point it just stops trading and then it just fades away and, and it that's back the off. only thing that likely makes sense to me because. I can, like the last time there was a sector, you could see on that sector, in the oil sector, you could see natural yeah. participants because on the backside, there was real volume that was coming in, right? That panic panic selling was happening. I do not see panic selling anymore. But even on something like REV, even on something like REV, uh, AERC, SIDU, uh, right? Those were all plus 700% extensions, but you see their backside, barely any range and it takes days for it to kind of flush back down and yeah. i cannot swing overnight purely because of the fact that locates are about nine they're like most brokers are saying that it's about a thousand percent a night the, the fee order. yeah the fee rate not only the locate fees have gone up but the fee rate the borrow rate overnight yeah. incredible a thousand percent yeah. oh uh, my like, god I'm, yeah yeah I'd kill you <laughs> yeah so yeah. I, I don't know how, like my style is basically coming in for range. And when I can't get that range, if I don't get that range in inter, intraday, I would rather swing. But if I, if I have to swing and pay about a thousand percent a night, I'm not going to do that. So yeah. it's a fine line that I'm still trying to figure out how do I need to position size. So at this pace, place, what I've done is I have divided my setups even more into a breakdown and I'm just sticking to one particular setup. And within that, I have variations to the quality quality of that setup, which is first red day. And if the extension is an X amount, this much money will be risk. The extension is X amount, you know, less than that, I'll reduce my risk. And because at the end of the day, that's the only setup that I kind of can make more sense to, but really shorting into resistance, right? It's not working because I see those low grinds, low grinds. If I cannot see volume coming in and everything is running on low volume, I am not comfortable taking that trade. I just cannot, I cannot make good rational decisions without volume. Yeah. All right. Interesting. So, okay. So as a systematic trader, what is your, this is something I've always wondered. Okay. So 
you know, like I'm more discretionary, so I'm adapting kind of like on the fly a lot of times. So at the moment, I have my setups, and I'll just kind of make adjustments. Uh, sometimes overnight, I'll just journal and I'll see something, and I'll change it overnight. Um, for systematic, since you guys back test and go through a lot of data, what is the process when the market's shifting? Do you gotta like you need like a like a solid few days to like months. adjust? I need enough place. Uh, it's just now that I've started extracting data and started to run some back testing. Uh, I didn't have enough data set to kind of make a decision on. You need a large sample size. And I still like to say I do not have enough sample size because there haven't been really many plays um, like the ones that I would like to see because I would like to make, I cannot make decisions on low volume plays I, because not many buyers and sellers are in it. So for me to actually see what the real stats are in this market, I need real liquidity. And the real liquidity, for example, if you go look at it, the only thing that I know is that the max dollar volume that you can trade in this market is 1.5 billion, after which the trend shifts. So if you look at REB, IMPP, HUSA, INDO, um, CDU, I believe also, uh, and AERC, no, AERC stopped at 700 million. I don't remember, you gotta check, but at least the ones that I tracked that ran on high volume, they're all stuffing at $1.5 billion volume. After which Wait, the trend one, You said 1.5 billion? Dollar eight, volume. Dollar volume, interesting. Yeah. So when you look at the daily chart and a lot of, so what you're mentioning, okay, like the on some stocks, you'll see the first day, the volume bar is a lot. And then yeah. like in the past, you'd be like, okay, so all these people, there's a lot of bag holders in there, that amount of volume, there's going to be, a, a, that's a lot of resistance in there, it's going to bleed out the next few days, maybe. And then the next day, it has like a tiny bit of, the volume bar is so tiny. And then like for the next few days, you know what I mean? And then it's just like, it doesn't match. It's like well, all this volume happened day one. Where is is the selling from that? You know exactly. That is why I'm saying that the war it's not organic on the way up. I am still trying to figure out why is liquidity suddenly dying on day three, day two, or even on the backside move. I I like last month my major drawdown actually had I just not touched AERC, I would have been up on the month. My major drawdown came from AERC because. I was like, everything is fitting in terms of like extension stats and like, why is the backside? I can't hit the backside the way I like to hit it. And it's really trapping me every time on low grinds and slow grinds. And even when I'm attacking into a resistance, it's low volume grind is really starting to you know take me out. And a lot of thousand, fifteen hundred, five hundred dollar paper cuts started adding up. It was my mistake as well to not uh, you know hit uh, in terms of. It was purely my mistake to keep attacking the same stock when it doesn't work. It was also probably because a lack of slip up in discipline because I did not have any other play to attack. So I really was just uh, trying to make sense of this one trade and forcing it. And I learned that mistake. I This month, I'm really, I've taken two trades the whole month and both have been green and I am refusing to take a trade until I see something that fits my setup. And I would rather have a consistency because this year I have just forgot about making money. It's more like size down, get the consistency, uh, adapt to the market. Also, I've started studying more instead of trading. I'm focusing more time studying now. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to branch out into large caps now. So I'm starting studying. I bought a lot of books. I've been busy studying. So when I'm not trading, I'm just reading now. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So you're adapting now in a way that you, you can trade other instruments too. That are old, so I'm, you know? I'm just focusing on a bigger picture, maybe yeah. five years on the road. How, you know, I could make no money this year, but five years I can excel, you know, in millions because I have yeah. more tools in my arsenal, but I got to put in the work now. Exactly. Constantly learning. Um, I did yeah. the, a, a podcast the other yesterday and that was like, yeah, for, no matter what level you're at, you're just at, at, you constantly, you got to constantly be a sponge, be open to learning. Um, yes. You mentioned Gritani. Uh, we were talking about Gritani yesterday, how he had to like uh, start fresh to learn how to do algos uh, yeah. with, with Triforce Trader. He started all over again. This guy made, let's say, like like six to ten million, and then he had to like become a student all over again. <laughs> you yes. know what I mean? And that's that's the way it is with trading. That's that's yes. what you know. You never you never you gotta always be open to to learning new things. Yeah, you gotta be comfortable with being uncomfortable. You yeah. know. Yeah, Absolutely. it's very important. It's very important. And, you know, I, I I literally was like, you know, I'm profitable. My setups are coming up. I don't need to, I stopped studying for a bit, right? 
and then the reality hit and i really struggled this year it's been a struggle for me and the only reason my drawdown isn't much like i'm really breaking in on the year maybe this last cut some weeks i've made about eight seven six seven thousand dollars in gains in the last couple of weeks so i am really break even on the year and i after locates as well so it's really from here i can still get ahead but i need to be more focused even if i make fifty thousand this year it's better than trying to go swing for the fences and trying to make two hundred thousand or three hundred thousand and then ending negative 50. you know i would rather yeah. play it safe until things start aligning in my favor and i know that once things align, I can really go, even if let's say by the end of the year, I'm at 300, 350, 400K, right? If once I get my hot market, within a couple of months, I can make two, $300,000 because my style fits that thing. You know, I make in small chunks, big money. Absolutely. So, so what is your process like for, to figure out some, when does like a, something click, like you see, you see something you want to explore deeper and you want to start back testing. You're like, oh, okay, the market is, is, is a, it's not giving us gappers now, uh, but it's giving us this. Like what, when do you get like that, that excitement to go deeper and like, and, and be like the scientist, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I really do not trade day one gappers. I just don't see the edge that well in it. I just feel like a, there, it's, it's a 60 to 70% win rate. Right. Uh, but the problem is that the locates are extremely high. So after you take out the locates, the edge in the day one gappers for me personally, the way I look at it, goes down okay so because you want to trade where the locates are in your favor because let's say 60 to 70 percent right uh sometimes these gappers have become range bound in this current market so you're not even getting the full range you cannot the goal of gappers was getting shorting into the shorting in the morning and extracting 30 40 percent range or even 20 plus percent range can get that so that's number one issue second issue is the locates are super expensive. So when you're trying to short those day one gappers, you're losing 20, 30% in locates and commissions. And then on top of that, you're not getting the range you want. So I do, I'm, I'm just not trading gappers anymore, okay? The second thing becomes, the second setup is shorting into resistance, okay? Which is uh, shorting a spike into resistance. Um, I am not trading that anymore as well, purely because of the fact that I am seeing low volume spikes. And when it's low volume spike, I don't know how much manipulation can come in and more volume can also come in, which can break through resistance. So if it's on a high volume, I'll probably short it. If it's on a low volume, I cannot force it because I know that more volume can come and spike that breakthrough resistance. So now that's another issue because I still don't know what the average volume this year is. I'm still figuring that out. And it's been a struggle for me because I'm seeing a variety of data set in here. You know, there have been 30 million, 20 million on a hundred percent spike. And then there has been a hundred million volume. And then there has been 200, 300 million volume. So uh, now I'm, I'm starting to break it down in dollar volume. What is the dollar volume that I need to start trading? Because that is how I might be able to extract it more further. So now I'm starting to look at so far, I know that if I'm shorting a multi-day runner that's extended pretty high, a, a bit 1.2 to 1.5 billion is where I'm starting to look for tops. Okay, so yeah. that is that is what the data, the only concrete data that I have seen so far. Uh, so that is one. Now the second thing is that um, I know that I am when the extensions go up, the more extended the stock gets the more likelihood it's in my favor, right? So I'm really waiting for extensions at this point and I'm letting shorts do the mistake and let that squeeze because I'm, you know, honestly, I'm really waiting for that one play that squeezes all the shorts and, and really goes up a thousand percent and a lot of accounts blow up. I'm waiting for that day. And like, that's when I'll start going long because I like going long a lot, uh, yeah. especially into close. A lot of my money comes like big money that I make is like buying those, high volume squeezers into close and then selling up the next day for a 30, 40, 50% gap up. And I like, I missed out on c because I was uh, not in my front of my computer because the markets are so dead, I don't even show up. In the mor morning, if it's dead, I look at my scans, I just shut down everything and I focus on office work. But c was a good example, something that I would have liked to buy into close. And you know, I would have easily bought five, 6,000 shares and sold it for a three to $4 gain in the morning. So you want to, okay, so for the listeners, they don't know, SIDU is, I, I'm pretty sure it's S-I-D-U. D-U, yeah. Um, hey, you want to go over that trade? Um, 
So yeah, you could you could open it up. Uh, so Sedu was a day one a squeezer on a pretty decent high volume. I think it did over a hundred plus million volume, I believe. Uh, this was back yeah. in in uh, June. It was back in June, right? yeah fifteenth of June. So if you look at it, it's a multi day breakout on high volumes, it's closing near the top. And if you look at the blog that I have written on the setups that I like to trade. Um, on Profitly, I've written a specific blog on how I was able to grow my account so quickly. It mentions this kind of setup to the T, and this is exactly what I look for. The high volume, day one breakouts, squeezing shorts into close. And that's when I'm the most aggressive. So that's one play that I would have liked to trade. I haven't seen many short squeezes happen, so I'm just sitting. Uh, I, I like making money when shorts are getting squeezed. Yeah, that one's that one. You could see the volume bars in the daily. That one makes sense. Yep. Yep. Uh, you know, so, so I would have long that into close. That's a perfect long for me. That is yeah. how I make big money on the long side. Now, do you have okay? So, like as a discretionary myself, sometimes I'll be like, okay, do they have an agenda? Are they trying to like run it up with algos to knock out some warrants? Does it have a catalyst? What's the catalyst? Um, you know, it, it, this is a technical breakout from the highs of the morning. So what goes through your mind when you're on a trade like this? Yeah. So um, for, for me, the way I like to look at it is that it's a low risk, high reward setting. Okay. So I, I have showed this style to some couple of friends of mine, but the way I like to do it is that I can be wrong 60% of the time. Okay. And I'm fine being wrong 60% of the time because my win rate is pretty 40%, right? But even though I'm losing 60%, let's say I take 10 trades, right? The six times that I lost, I'm losing, let's say 1500 on an average. Okay. So how much did I lose? Like, uh, six, five, so about $9,000, right? Um, I lost about 9K, but the other four times that I'm going to hit it, I'll probably make 25, 30K yeah. on each trade. Okay. So it's because this kind of setups, the, the only thing I need is no dilution. Okay, I do not want to see any shelf, no warrants, no uh, offering or oh, it's your whole it's overnight. Yeah, because if, if, if it has a shelf yes. and you're overnight. If I'm going yeah. overnight, I do not want to see any of those. So I use dilution tracker, quickly look at it and also just look at, you know, uh, the F filings, the recent filings quickly, but really doesn't take a lot of time for me because dilution tracker has made it easy, uh, you know, uh, just quickly. Yeah. Oh man, it's great. Yeah, yeah. They, they really yeah, made it's, it it's easy. a great, before it was a lot of work, but now I yeah. love that tool. It's great. So if I see that there is nothing and I'm seeing it's a technical breakout, squeezing shorts into close, or even if it's not a breakout and, but it's squeezing shorts into close on a high volume, abnormally high volume. And you can see, through each high of the day, shorts are getting stuffed. You know, it's stuffing, trapping, going back up, stuffing, trapping, going back up, right? So you can see that shorts are getting tra trapped every level. And the fact that it's high volume stuff, that means high big money player is getting stuck at that level, right? So that for me immediately comes onto my radar, but I'm not buying it. I'm really not buying it until 3.59 or 4 p.m. or sometimes after hours, right? The way I'm doing it is my risk is my closing price. So I want that stock to move away from today's closing price as fast as possible. And I probably lock in 50% of my gain into the spike, right? Because sometimes they squeeze quickly. That's another time trick I use. Sometimes they squeeze quickly after close, you see a big pop, right? Yeah. You sell half into that pop because that's probably a 10% pop. You sell half into that pop. And then sometimes they fade back down. So you can put your risk at break even, sell half. And even if I lose, I'm probably coming out for a small gain. Or a small loss, but when I hit it, I'm probably making twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars on the trade. Yeah. Okay. So this one in particular, this one and some others. I remember there was a few others also that have this similar behavior late day and then continue in the after hours. And then they, they even sometimes they'll have it in the pre market, but a lot of times you know they're over exhausted in the pre market as well. Yep. But this kind of play. IMPP. Uh, another one. IMPP. Yeah. Another one. So the, um. This was a. This happened a lot of this year, I think. No, right? no. Like this last happened year last well. year in 2020 as well. This is my go-to setup. Another one is that the stock makes a huge run on high volume, and yeah. then it fades back 40, 50 percent into close. But the fact that it ran on abnormally high volume and it's going back 40, 50 percent into close, I know that is going to bounce. So carve, carve, 
uh, uh, there was another one that was running a day before Carve that got delisted. Um, started with S, I don't remember, but those were some good setups that like they fade 40, 50% into close, but ran on abnormally high volume. And those are also a good setup to buy, uh, you know, like something like sector plays like KODK, SPI, or DWAC. Those are the ones I, I like, those are the ones where I'll really be longing abnormal size. Oh, there's one that came to mind. There's one BCEL. Did you see this one? I think it was back in like earlier this year. In the last five minutes on a Friday, it went from like $2 all the way to $7. And in the after hours, it yeah. continued yes. further. Yes, but I don't want it to happen. So if you see BCEL, volume is pretty low. It's a 60 million volume, right? I don't want that. I don't want end, end of the day moves. Oh, I, want, I see. I, I want see. consistent moves it's, throughout it's, the day. It's I want churning. To get yeah, I want yeah, churning yeah, yeah, yeah. throughout yeah. the day. I want shorts to get stuck at every level because I'm not capitalizing on buyers to push it. I'm really for betting that those shorts who are stuck are going to feel the pain and I'm just tagging on to add on to their pain even more. So, so, so having that, that mentality, that's, that's kind of discretionary. Cause like you're, you're my you're, longs are purely discretionary. My shorts are purely statistical. My longs are very discretionary. Cause you're, you're visualizing all these, all these shorts getting stuck in there. And then you're like, yep. oh, you have your technical levels that you're looking at. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay. Okay. So you're, you're so you, very interesting. So when did you, do you think, cause in my mind, I'm not, I just short, I want to start longing to, to, evolve we all gotta evolve <laughs> you know I, i'm like a gorilla i need to evolve you know so yeah <laughs> but um okay so i always thought it was better to have like longs i don't know about systematic but like you got to be very uh it's like um with my shorts i i i anticipated going higher most of the time and i i add into it with longs i i can't picture myself doing that it's like no averaging down uh and then i will never average down though yeah so you just you use one shot you keep it simple you have your risk and you let yeah, it go so so ideally if you notice a lot of times it's gonna like pop fade back down go under the closing price consolidate and then when it pops back over the closing price is when i'm in entering size keeping my risk at that low and then if it breaks breaks that low i'm out i don't i just don't even bother because i know that i can lose even 70 percent of the time and but when i hit those trades the big ones i really make a lot more money so i'm fine losing you know seven times out of ten even six eight times out of ten because even two plays will make me a lot more money but you yeah. need to be under you need to understand that it is not something that you will constantly win on because if you look at BCEL, it faded back down, right? Oh yeah, so I shorted that at the, at the after hours. Yeah, it was crazy. Yes, so the, the problem is that if it doesn't hold, the, if it goes below the closing price, I'm out because I don't want to risk it. I don't want to, uh, you know, be stuck in a huge gap down the next day. So I'm really looking for that quick move away from the closing price. Okay. Um, and for the longs, like, do you have like a, like a, your risk level is a lot tighter? It's very tight, yeah. Yeah, it's very unless tight. I'm doing a breakout trade, unless I'm doing an intraday breakout trade, which I stopped doing it. I just my the way I like to trade, I I really I I have this patience issue where like I want the trade to work right away, and if it doesn't work, I kind of start getting nervous or I start getting annoyed, and like I don't like watching the screen that much. I rather just come take the trade, go to bed, or like come take the trade or start doing my office work and just keep an alert, right? Uh, but if I don't get that, I'm very quick to exit the trade um, because I like to, if the trade doesn't work quickly, then there's something wrong, right? And breakouts don't work right away. They take some time. So the way I figured out the breakout is probably, let's say I want to risk $3,000 on a breakout trade. I probably risk 500 on intraday entry, but my thesis is still swing. My thesis is still swing but so i'm gonna risk 500 because what's gonna what's the worst i'm gonna lose 500 cool but i will not take any profit because as soon as i enter i'm purely thinking a swing mentality and i'm thinking of adding into a winner so that 500 risk might really be used as a way to just build some profit cushion so maybe i'm up on a five 500 risk i'm up 1500 bucks right three is to one let's say right into close so now i have that 1500 is not my profit actually i'm looking at 1500 plus 500 plus another thousand as my risk that I can risk, but I'm really losing 2000 of my original equity or uh, 1500 of my original equity. And I'm using 1500 from the profits that I made on that trade. And now I'm tagging them together to basically add more size into close for the gap up. 
And when did you come up with that like mentality? This, this are all, uh, that's what I said. Position sizing was something I had to really work on how to add to a winner while keeping my dollar risk constant, right? Uh, yeah. Something I played around a lot on charts. That was the majority of my work that I sat down and started doing. So you figured that out, what works for you as like that, from journaling, from going over trades, yeah. from going over statistics and then thinking, okay, how can I uh, do better at this trade? Maybe I need yeah. to start picture. So it's, it's crazy. That's, that's kind of like, you had to change your view on the, on the way the, you know, your view on positioning yeah. to get it right. You know? So do you think that how many versions of that did you try out? It's still always a work in progress. It's always a work in progress, right? There's always something I can improve upon. I have, uh, when I observe a pattern, the first thing I look into it is the first thing I think when I look at a pattern is, okay, what is the win rate? right? The first important thing, is it even worth it? Okay. If it's a low win rate, can I extract more range? If I figure out that there's something it's, there is interesting about it, right? The next thing I'm really thinking about is position sizing. I, you can be a shitty trader. I'm not the best trader. I'm a, probably a shitty trader, but I am very good at position sizing. You know, when it's my market, I can really minimize my risk a lot of times and maximize my down upside just by, so I'm not scared of losing in a row. I'm not scared of losing 10 times in a row and be, you know, in a, in a decent, because my drawdowns are not huge. Like, I think I did not have a single win in the month of June. I think in the end I started winning, but uh, throughout the first of June till the win, I was losing, 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 losing. And my drawdown was about $8,000. Yeah. So, I, yeah. Yeah. So you're able to, you know, you're okay with that, especially now that you've built yourself a cushion from all the, from the two years. So how, how did that go into play? Cause like in the beginning, it's a lot harder to trade in the beginning. Cause you don't have that cushion. You yeah. know, so you gotta, you gotta be super tight. Um, yeah. And then now you, you, you understand that markets change. You understand that you gotta, that you, you know, you gotta figure things out. So you're, you're okay. It's a lot more, I guess, less anxiety now. Yeah. You know? So. Like, I mean, even that June's drawdown, I'm, I've recovered it in three trades. Like whole of June's drawdown, I've recovered it in three trades, right? And it really, that is, so that's what it is. Keep your losses small. Keep it very small. Keep it very tight. Learn. I think, you know, trading, most people think that you have to have perfect executions and you have to have, you know, top take or like good charts, looking chart. You know, in my opinion, anyone who's just showing their charts and not showing how they take their positions is wrong because you can have a $5 entry, yeah. five share at the top, but you can have a thousand shares at the bottom and then you can lose by cutting it in the middle because your position sizing was wrong. So in my opinion, if you want to get profitable, Focus on position sizing. That yeah. is the name of the game. How to build a position with a understanding of statistics with respect to range and the winning percentage of the setup. And then learn how to build a position around that setup and learn how to add to winners. Once you get really good at adding to winners, and once you understand that how much percentage of your position you need to hit near the top, how much of your percentage of the position you need to hit on the second fail bounce? And then how do you add into the fail bounce, right? I never activate my leverage until I'm fully into the money and I'm my, my risk is far away. And once I'm far away, I'm not scared to activate my leverage, right? I can have a $100,000 account size and have a $250,000 position and still my risk might be $3,000. Yeah, so interesting. Uh yeah, about so I remember um, I was what you mentioned right now. It just came to my mind on Kimfo. You see like Kyle Williams on there. He's like the, the he made the most this year. Kyle and, is great. Yeah, and, but he his his all his gains came from like three or four trades. Like yep. for in, in January he nailed one, and then like he was break even uh, pretty much until another one came. And they're all the same play. Uh, they're all the Chinese IPO yep. setup, but they yep. just dumped. So he was able to like, even though he's trading multiple strategies, he saw one and he, he just goes way bigger on those yes. and is able to wipe out all his gains, all yep. his all his losses. Yeah. So it's it's like what you're saying is like that. It's like, okay, you can have these drawdowns, but like you, you just need like that one or two plays and you're yep. back, you know, it's it's like nothing, yes. you know, you're back. So it was same in 2020 for me every month in after after April, I would say every month I would start red. I would be down 4,000, 5,000, 6,000. And then at the end of the month, I would end the month plus 15,000, plus 20,000. Because that one or two plays in the end of the month would come 
and I'll hit them hard and then I'll be positive on the month, you know? Um, really, it is, it's, that's the thing about trading, you know? That's the scary part about it. And that's also the good part about it that you never know when that big trade might be coming. So this is why capital preservation is the name of the game as well, right? Yeah. Because you yeah. want to stay alive for that big trade. And another thing is you want to not drain your mental capital because if you take this, you know, I would rather take one huge loss than take, I mean, it's a fine line, but like I would rather take one $3,000 loss and that fit my setup very well than take 10 $200 losses on shitty setups that I wasn't even planning to trade because at least on the one that I actually lost, I was able to learn something from it. The ones yeah, that I actually... Yeah took random trades, I actually couldn't learn anything from it. So I, there was no chance for me to improve upon. Yeah, man, it's, it's really good that you said that. I, I know when I was uh, start more learning in 2020 or so, I would take a lot less trades. You, so in the, in, in the United States, we have under PDT. You didn't have that, though, yeah. right? No, I was Canadian. Yeah. I was lucky that way. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, it's crazy because, like, you're not lucky when you have that. But in hindsight, I think it really did help me. Because you're forced, you're, you're absolutely, whether you have discipline or not, you have to obey the rule. <laughs> yes. Uh, you yes, know, so exactly. you can have bad discipline, but like you have that rule, you you can't, that's that's the rule. So exactly, I had to be very selective. So like, let's say I had a loss uh, that took up one day trades. Now I only have two more trades. So like that loss, I would sit down and like milk that loss with journaling, figuring it out and really learning. Then a couple of those losses, were, they were decent they're pretty big for the account size i had back then and it's like i'm learning and and i i have my criteria and the stock fit the criteria and that's why i entered it and i had a big loss because of discipline or whatever reasons and i would figure it out and i think yeah if you trade a lot like a forex trader in, uh, in or whatever you don't track it like you're getting you're bleeding out and you're not getting any lessons out of it i can't do that i i just cannot somehow it's not my personality to come in for a 10 to 20 cent move. I, I rather not take the trade. Cause like when I start thinking about locates and I start thinking about 10, you know, when I'm like, okay, if I have to pay locates, it better be range. There better be range. If I'm not getting that range, I am too cheap to pay for locates. You know, I just don't want to, cause I've very early on in my career, my first drawdown came from locates, not from yeah. losing money. Uh, so I know how important locates are. And uh, so you mentioned the brokers, which brokers do you have? Like, for example, I just, I have a guardian Cobra center point, and now I'm going to open up a new one with Hilltop. Did you, did, are those the four? I have Hilltop. Yeah. Speed, uh, success trader. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Success trader. Yeah. 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 Um, how, so what, what do you think of them? Are they coming through with the locates? Uh, so I just opened an account. I didn't fund it. Uh, so I have Cobra trade zero and guardian. Um, oh, trade really? zero. Okay. That's fine. Yeah, really what I'm using at the moment is not using anything except Guardian uh, because Guardian is actually, it's a great broker. I, I really love them and they always, almost always have access to locates and I have a 50% discount with them. So I really get, yeah uh, you know, whatever I'm paying. I'm always paying less locates than even what Cobra can offer me. So yeah. my, my cost is pretty low. And even then after 50% discount and paying less than what most people pay for Cobra, I'm still on a drawdown with respect to locates. And I don't know if you saw my Twitter, I posted a whole statistics of my year with respect to how much money I made each month with each graph. And then I also said, this is exactly how much I paid in locates, right? And I probably flipped it. I think I, it should have been Cobra where I paid more, or Guardian where I paid, I think about 16,000 or 17,000 and Cobra I paid 3,000, but still, it was a big chunk of money, even though I am not an everyday trader, even though I don't come into the markets every day, I don't trade every day. Imagine someone who is waiting for range and things like that. And maybe someone, if someone has figured out how to trade locates, you know, and, and trade this range bound markets, I would love to know without spending too much on locates. Cause I, I really don't know how, you know, like if you're coming in for 10 cents, and you're uh, and you're paying three cents on locates, and then one cent is going into commission. I don't want to waste my time for six cents again. Yeah. So you do, okay. So for the people listening, okay. So the reason why he's spending a lot on locates is because he is reserving them early morning and not using them. So a yeah. lot, so a, a lot of good traders they will get the locates first. They won't jump into the trade because that's that's discipline. Because <laughs> a lot of traders last lack discipline, and they will do the they'll get the locates. And then short it right away. Yeah. You know, so 
So when you when you get it, you're like, okay, you, how do you forecast or the odds of that stock falling into your system down so the line that's in, been in an the hour? Main or so. Problem, because in the beginning of the year, I was locating seven, eight, nine thousand shares, and I would not take the trade, and I would pay four hundred, five hundred dollars on the day, and I would really not use it. Uh, but really, what I think in the recent month, what has changed? is the fact that I have now understood that Guardian almost always have locates. Because initially I was new to Guardian beginning of the year because I did not have, use, uh, you know, it was my early days with them. So I did not know if their locates are going to run out. But now understanding more is that they are they are a clearinghouse, actually. So yeah, they're, they're, you know, they're their own clearinghouse. Yes. They're, they're their own clearinghouse. So their job is to actually just purely provide locates. Cobra is not. Cobra has to go to different vendors to ask for locates, right? Same. Success Trader has to go ask for multiple locates sources. But Guardian's pure job is to actually provide locates. That's how they make their money. So, and the fact that I have fifty percent off makes it an icing on the cake. So now I can, I literally can. I, I like yesterday when a couple of days ago uh, when I shorted uh, what was the name of the ticker that uh, was on a first red day? FFIE, FF, yeah, FFIE. I literally did not, I was like, no, nah, I'm not spending on locates. What if it gaps up and goes green? It's not a first red day, you know, until 9.25. It's 9.28 is when I decided to locate and I decided to hit the thing before the market opened because I'm like, okay, it's a good price that I'm getting. I can short it. My risk is pretty close. So I'm going to short it. And I'm now I'm not going to locate until I actually know that the trade is there. It's a lot of money that you lose, man. At least for, for me, I, I'm really, uh, I know it's a cost of doing business, but it can add up very fast. Yeah. Do you ever try um just wait waiting for the locates like what when the yeah. stock hits exactly your criteria and then you grab the locates? I have started doing that a lot now. I really wait for the exact thing to match up and then I'm gonna I already have it like to click like already the pop-up is ready. Like, you know, let's say I have 5,000 locate, I check it, I click okay, and then you know you have the pop-up. Are you sure you want to locate? That pop-up is ready. But when oh, as okay. soon as it comes to that level, I click okay and quickly hit a market order. So yeah. Because if you have, uh, I mean, you're using Guardian for the most part, but if you have all the brokers, you, you one of them will probably have a decent price. You know? Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, okay. So with that, so I saw you on with Spike Eats. Uh, you want to give a like how Spike Eats fit into all all your statistical edge? Like yeah, yeah it Spike It is great, man. Uh, they they changed the game in terms of like extracting huge set of data because like. If you want to, what I like about it is I can think of any idea and quickly run a huge query and have about hundreds of records dating back to five years or, you know, six, seven, you know, six years. And I can increase my data set more and more, uh, which I couldn't do before. I, I had to, you know, do so much manual calculation, understand. One thing that I would love for them is to figure out the market cap and float accurately, because I don't think they still do that well. Uh, so a lot of times I, if I don't think that the float is right, I have to go manually check the market cap and float uh, or go into filings that day and see what was the market cap on that particular day. And sometimes that becomes cumbersome, but overall they're doing a great job. And it's really helps me uh, save time in terms of statistical analysis. So now I have this idea that I've been seeing in large cap when like a stock makes a huge X amount of move on a green body candle on a billion dollar cap. I've always seen the next day there is a continuation move. So I'm actually now figuring out, I'm making queries as to what is the percentage of the body that needs to happen for that gap up and continuation to happen on this gap up, on those billion dollar caps. Because it makes sense to kind of enter into close on those billion dollar caps and then hold on to next day and then sell into the morning spike, right? Um, seems like a very repeatable pattern that I've been seeing on this uh, billion dollar caps. Now, the statistics on that will come as to what is the exact criteria as to the body as to the range of the body that I need to look for. So then I can program my scanners saying that this is the market cap and this is the body into close, then pop on my scans and then I'll be willing to take the trade. Interesting. Okay. Um, now, I remember with all that that you just mentioned, I, uh, about a week ago or two weeks ago even, I think it was, I interviewed another system trader, uh, Evan Shunk. Maybe you're familiar. Oh, yeah, I love him. Yeah, I know. Yeah, him. yeah, yeah him. so he was saying on, on the podcast, okay, so he uses Python for data. And he, right now, he's he's a, he's a the same situation you're talking about. He's in the same situation as far as trying to figure out this range-bound market and coming up with a system for it, uh, adapting. And uh, he was saying one thing he's doing now is going back 
for the data, he's going back five years uh, as part of his system. So what do you think of that? And are you doing something similar? Yeah, I was running 2018 and 2019 data to figure out, but here's the problem. The liquidity in 2018 and 2019 was still organic, even though it was a low volume market compared to 2020, it was still normal retails coming in and trading against each other. And then, you know, the more experienced traders making money and the even though the low, let's say 30 million was the max volume 2019, right? Let's say 50 million was the max volume, for example, or 2018. But out of that 50 million, 30 million might be organic volume or 35 million might be organic volume and 15 million might be our algo driven, right? So yeah. still you knew that there is organic. My main issue that I've been seeing, which I'm still trying to figure out how to detect organic versus inorganic volume. I don't know if anyone has idea, please let me know. Um, is I want to figure out what stocks on the way up are actually buyers driven and what is algo driven. Because once you can at least get some kind of hint about that, then you can figure out the position sizing on the backside how well, heavy i want to hit it one one thing that comes to mind with that is uh i don't know if there's a way to track it with with uh in a system like you know like python or spike eater right <laughs> definitely not but like the level two or or like the the exchange name on the level two and the amount of size because i know different algos use like uh different sizes to like trade with each other it's almost like i don't know if you know uh, baseball, the game of baseball, yeah. like the third base coach is giving signs to the guy in first base to steal the base, and no one, no, no one can decipher that. So the algos, um, they're kind of feeding each other codes all the time, uh, and the type, the, the amount of size and volume, you know, that comes out of nowhere. At a, there's a way to track it, but I, I don't know if there's there's a something to track it with. If yeah, that's break, it's like some MIT level engineering you know what i mean <laughs> i'm trying to figure that out i'm currently running seeing comparing it against 2020 data and trying to see if there's any clue i can get it i still haven't so now the next thing i'm going to do is i'm going to start running uh, linear regressions on the current volume on big volume plays versus the big volume plays in 2020 and see if there's any correlation model that i can figure out so those are the next things i'm doing Really, I don't expect to make much money this year unless market suddenly changes. I am come to terms with it, but what I can do is better adapt for future market and better really get better. So I'm fine not making money. I'm fine as long as I don't go into big drawdowns. I'm fine sitting idle because I know even if I get 10, five good plays this whole year, five A plus extension plays that I like with range like IMPP and oil sectors, I can still make over 150, 200,000 on the year and still have a high year. So why would I trade and put myself in harm's way every day? I'm just going to sit and wait for this place. Yeah. So you mentioned that. Okay. So you, you are, uh, you still approach trading, like with the part-time like mentality you're doing is on the side. So what, what do you do with, with, for work and all that? Uh, I'm a software developer. I'm a software developer for a company called point 72. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about it. It's owned by Steve Cohen. Uh, ah, okay. Yeah. Ah, okay. So you, so that's the type of engineering that you did in, in school and all that. Like, so yeah, so I, I'm, I'm basically uh, working on the web product side, um, nothing related to market or anything like that. It's purely software for one of the products and on a front end, very much focused on the web development, but uh, trading, I'm doing my own portfolio trading in the mornings. And also I really think that you are in this to actually enjoy life. So why not start tuning, tuning your style that, you really don't like look every trader. I would really suggest look into your stats. Every stats, if you look into it, majority of your money comes from very few plays, very few plays. And majority of your drawdowns comes from most of the plays that shouldn't you shouldn't be taking. So the goal is actually not to trade well. The goal is actually to figure out when to take a trade. Right? That is it. You do not you can be you can be very bad with your trading. I would like to say I'm not the best in terms of my execution. It looks good on the chart, probably because I'm, I've gotten good with experience to take the, to take the uh, you know, near the top, I can read the tape well. But in the start, I was not like that, right? The start, even though I was pretty bad with my execution in the start, I was still able to make pretty good money and grow my account fast. The reason is because I was able to sit on hands a lot of times, not be taking a trade because i was able to see the setup build up i was and i was getting excited every day like okay i'm gonna I'm, i do not want to focus on anything else focus my energy and my equity to this one setup that's building up 
And when it finally built up and I see the momentum shift, I have my mentally, I'm ready. I haven't taken a draw on any, any other play. I'm fresh. I'm watching it from fresh eyes, from a macro perspective. So I can come in and hit sides. Awesome. And uh, okay, so let's start to wrap it out up now. Okay, so what what was your, your most memorable ticker or most memorable trade? I would say CYDY is always- CYDY. Yeah, it, it is what changed me from a small account to a relatively medium size account, right? So, yeah, uh, so from what I remember what you said earlier, you went from like 11,000, you made a $17,000 gain on top of that? Yeah, yeah. So I probably <laughs> made a hundred and, I don't know, 180% in a single day. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, that was, uh, okay. So that, that had the big drop, right? Is that, was that what it was? On Chumano 2020. Yeah. 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 I think, I think Jack Kellogg made, made a ton on that one too. Yeah. Like, yeah. So um, I, I literally top picked it at 997 and I think the 10 was the top and I was like, okay, I have 10 is the top. I can see the tape turning at 10. I hit full 3000 shares at 997, a $33,000 position size on an $11,000 account. And uh, when it dropped, I I was watching it all day, all afternoon. And as soon as it dropped, I probably left a lot on the table because I covered uh, prematurely. But then when it figured out dip, I, I loaded a youth size on the long side. Then I was able to capitalize the bounce. And then I was able to use previous two profit cushions. So I'm like, now I'm, I'm decent in the money. And then I was able to hit the backside bounce pretty heavy and then you use it for the fade. Um, okay, so a little background on CYDY. I know because I traded it actually short early on i was too too early actually i lost money on it uh yeah. when, when i was learning it was a very small account that i had but cydy was a paid promotion pump during before covid and then yeah. when covid happened it just took off because they were claiming like their their drug that was like for cancer or something it cures yeah. they were claiming it cures aids it cures covid it cures everything like five different things they paid, I remember they paid for a promotion to be on Fox, Fox and Friends over the weekend, yeah. not Fox News, like Fox and Friends has a different segment where it's almost like Benzinga, but like for other things and you could, they paid to be on there. So it was like a paid promotion. And then they sent emails, they had, and it was on the OTCs and they were claiming all types of things, you know, so it, it took so long for it to drop. But like, if you're waiting, if you know that it's a paid pump and dump and like you, you're waiting for it you can catch it on that day that's yeah. where to go so how did so did, was that your thesis behind here like okay this is a pump and dump i just gotta wait for no it to dump. no i i just was like oh this is extended enough that i'm interested and i took some losses like you know i was pretty i'm very good at cutting losses so i was able to take a hundred dollar loss a two hundred dollar loss yeah. $400 loss, a $300 loss. But really those small losses were still fine. I was fine because I saw that that range because you know, that's what I talk about. Big volume up means huge flush down. If you do not get huge volume up on the way up on a tr normal market, you, would, you wouldn't get a huge flush on the way back down because there is nobody to sell. Um, so I really knew that 40% drop might come in it. And I just wanted to be ready to attack it and get in near key levels. Because even if I have to cut, I can keep taking multiple hundred dollar losses because I know that when I hit the big move, I'm going to make a lot of money. And that is how I still trade. You know, I, I'm looking for those huge extensions. I'm looking for those extensions on volume. And I'm fine taking losses along the way because now my losses are relative to my account. So when people see $3,000 loss, it doesn't affect me much because I know when I'm hitting that range and when I get that range on the backside, I'm gonna, probably going to make $30,000, $40,000. So I'm fine really next year what i want to do is trade even less than i'm trading now probably take five six seven trades a year that's it and like and ducks like ducks exactly because yeah. that's all you need to make half a million million dollars a year even with a smaller account trust me like i've yeah. ran many probabilities i've done a lot of probabilities and i've run many simulations as to how you should be taking take the one that has the most edge and as soon as you are out of a range bound market and a trending market, those are the plays that will make you so much more money. You can short the backside. You can buy the dip. You can short the bounce. You can short the bounce on the daily, you know, the full framework. And that's it. That's all you need to make over $100,000 on a single ticker. That's all you need to do. And then wait for the next time it comes around. Wow, man. Awesome. Um, All right. So where do you see yourself in the future with trading? I know you just mentioned next year to take less trades, but overall, like maybe like a bigger picture, five, 10 year plan. 
What do you think? Yeah, so five, 10 year plans. So now I've already started preparing for the next five years, which is uh, I want to get into options. I want to learn how to trade large caps. Something that I, this market was a rude awakening that I am tuned to focused on a small niche and I need to diversify my niche. So I've started preparing now. It's not like I'm taking any trades into large caps, into any of those sectors, but I'm really just learning, gathering data. It might take me a year or two years. Uh, in the meanwhile, I have this couple of good setups that I can trade pretty well keep making decent gains from that. And then once I have another tool in my arsenal, get a strategy in the large cap, trade with equities. And then once I figure out how to include options with it, I'll probably make a lot of money in the next five, six years. You know, I'm in no rush to uh, get rich very quick. I can take it one trade at a time. Awesome. And uh, any, any book recommendations? Uh, so I bought this book called Volume Price Analysis that I'm studying uh, by Anna Kulings, I think. It's oh, pretty yeah, nice yeah. so far. And then there's another one called Price Action Breakdown that I'm also studying. That's pretty nice. Really talks about supply demand and how to see uh, more support and resistance because almost as much as that plays well in small caps, it works even better in large caps, you know, the whole supply demand psychology. So I really want to nail it down even more and understand volume even better than what I understand. Uh, and because I'm going to probably apply a lot of those concepts in large cap and then yeah. figure out a data tracking around that concepts. And uh, so it's a work in progress right now. Yeah, absolutely. It's cool, man. It's so like it's, it's interesting always how we go from small caps. We make a good amount of money and then there's always the next level. And it, with, with trading in stocks and, and markets, it's always another yes. level. So the way if you think about it. Right. If you think about it, actually, I was actually giving it a thought. I'm like, wait, if I have an A plus setup in every market cap, I could actually probably every month have three to four big trades in every market cap range. Yeah. Right. So why do I need to trade subpar setups in this market cap when I can actually expand? It's a, my yeah, market? waste your time. Yeah. Based on time, right? And go to some other market cap and probably try to make thirty, forty thousand dollars in that market cap. And then when small cap heats back come back into the smaller market cap and make big money. And then when it dies down, go back to the other market cap, you know? You, you know, you just mentioned that a thought popped up in my head. So so last year I was trading in uh, in Puerto Rico and in, in Luchi, San Luchi's trade space over there. And yeah. there was, a, there was a, a big trader there that was trading for like 20 years or so. And this guy, he calls himself a financial trader. He's not a small cap, mid cap, he trades everything. And he would trade options when he sees a play there, like you said, like, once in a while, he'll trade small. He has so much experience. A small yeah. caps, he'll short sell or whatever. He would even buy crypto when when the whole crypto market was exactly. You know, uh, what do you call it? Doing that, you know, it's all over leverage and every, liquidations. Yep. And then he'll yeah. buy the dip of that, and then like he'll switch and like short sell a small cap but not trade every day, you know? Yes, exactly. There is an A plus setup every month in every market. There is multiple A plus setups. If you understand, if you can trade multiple sectors and multiple market caps, like I would, and that's why if you, most of the time, I think our, us traders should focus on studying, not on trading. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well said, well said. Well, Karen, man, great podcast. I really enjoyed talking with you and connecting with you. And hopefully we'll, we'll talk soon. Maybe have another podcast down the line in the future, see how things are going. And uh, yeah, man, it's been awesome uh, talking oh, to you. Definitely. Thanks for having me on, David. Absolutely, man. It. Have a great night. I'll see you.